Kia ora and welcome to this week's episode of the Mina Amso Show. This week we are talking to specialist obstetrics, gynecologist and sonologist Maha Haddad. So Maha is an Iraqi immigrant moved to New Zealand about 28 years ago, so quite a, a while back with her husband Imad. Both are doctors and both have pretty full-on lives. She took her time to talk to me today. Before we chat to Maha, I just want to say that we're on YouTube and I am thankful that we finally reached 10,000 views and this video will be recorded um, in advance so you might have gotten 11,000 who knows but thank you so much for subscribing and liking and watching and um, it's because of you that I do this so keep doing that and tell me that you're liking it so if you get a value out of this episode hit the like button so Maha hello hello hi Kiyora. Kiyora. thank you so much for being here yeah, it's a pleasure Everyone seems to be wondering about Maha Haddad. Maha, you are, you are fun, you are active, you are multi-talented, um, can be mischievous, I'm not too sure. <laughs> I'm just going to be like controversial to say that. Um, you are super intelligent and you have a full-on life. Tell me, you, you know, you've been to New Zealand now for 28 years. Mm -hmm. But New Zealand hasn't been your number one choice. You were supposed to be going to another country. Yes. Um, and we want to find out what happened. How did you end up in New Zealand? Thank you very much, Mina. And it's a pleasure being here. Um, you know very well that I've watched your journey from coming here to getting your degree, then getting into um, journalism. So you're doing a great job. First impression of New Zealand. Is that it? <laughs> this is the first impression. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> what people don't realize is Baghdad was a very big city. Mm. Okay. Mm. We're talking about a large, very large city. Uh, um, don't look at the images now. But when I left Iraq, Iraq was a very westernized country, highways, developed. motorways, well-developed buildings, yeah. things. It actually looked pretty Cool. So yeah. coming to New Zealand and finding it, the first impression I th thought, come on, this is very quiet. Mm -hmm. It is so, so quiet. You know, no noise, very clean, clear. I remember the day, 31st of July, beautiful, sunny winter, winter day. day. Mm -hmm. And it's just rained, mm -hmm. but the sun was shining and everything glistened. Oh. I've never seen the sky that blue. I've never seen so much mm -hmm. green in my life. Mm -hmm. And the air just felt great. We had friends who immigrated before us. They came and picked, up, picked us up from the airport. But then um, New Zealand in, at the time, 1994, were a completely different place. It was very, it, it looked more like a small town compared to where I, my impression. I. I've traveled, I've been to Europe, I've been to the UK, I'm used to big cities. So New Zealand was like a very, very small town compared to what I've seen before. Some people say it's the countryside of the UK. It is, it is, it is really. I've been yeah. to the countryside of the UK, but it is very much like the countryside of the UK. Mm -hmm. it, does it still look like countryside to you? No, not anymore. Um, maybe if you get outside of New Zealand, like, sorry, outside Auckland, but mm -hmm. not 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 Auckland itself. Now, no, Auckland now is, is nothing compared to the Auckland I arrived in too. How different? Oh, it's it's a very much busier now. It's it's bigger, it's crowded, more crowded. It's more like a metropolitan city now. When I arrived into it, it was more like a, a very beautiful seaside city, mm. if you know what I mean. That's, mm. that's what it looked like when I first came in. And community for you became, the Iraqi community existing in New Zealand became your family because you came from Iraq while well, you were in Jordan with Imad, your newly wedded husband, and you had some friends here in New Zealand. Yes. And they became your family. Well, that's what happens, doesn't it? That's like these, when people go into places where, you know, a new place, mm. they try to find something familiar to hang into because you left everything and you're coming to a place you're coming to the unknown really yes we knew we're coming here we knew there what we have to do mm. we could speak the language it's an advantage that people you, you know oh, english. english we don't have any problems with that mm. but 
it's still the unknown. It's still the unfamiliar. And you do try to hang on to everything that reminds you. Reminds you. Besides, um, these friends have been through things before us, so they actually can 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 lead us. Say, you can do this, you can do that. This is how, you know, if you're looking to, to rent a house, it's a nice area to settle in and all that sort of thing. When we came at the time, you couldn't just go into the internet and search where's the best areas. You know, these days you can do your search at home before you go anywhere. And there's so many bloggers and YouTubers who can show you. You can actually visit a country without even moving from your chair. Exactly. I'm talking 1994. No internet. Okay. As my son says, YouTube is younger than I am. <laughs> I've got a son who's 18. He said, Mom, do you realize oh I was born before YouTube? Wow. And it wasn't like when you travel, you, you didn't, you know, you have to depend on magazines and things like that. We still, we still sent letters <laughs> and received letters at the time. Telephone. We use the telephone. Um, it's it's different time. Different so time, yeah. mm. I mean, you still you st- stick with the people you know for safety. Um, why did you leave New Zealand or you leave for New Zealand? Like, what was the motivating factor for you? Was it just because you wanted a change of atmosphere, change of countries, or were you afraid from Iraq? Or because in nineteen ninety four things weren't so bad. As no, they were. It now it was. It was just you know I've had enough wars. Mm-hmm. Been through two big wars. Um, seen so many deaths. Um, Life has started in Iraq become quite difficult. And we also wanted a future. We wanted a future for ourselves, we wanted a future for our children. And we realized that this, the area, the Middle East is, is so unstable that you cannot guarantee anything. Everything has started to become really difficult. And we were under sanctions, we can do a lot of things. Um, what people don't realize and don't know that the sanction has destroyed the Iraqi people. Um, it was meant to be against the regime, mm. but they actually, it was targeted to destroy the Iraqi people. The stuff that we have been through and what I have seen, it was quite devastating. Mm. We we didn't have medicine, we didn't have um, um, the proper treatment to treat our patients. We were restricted to what we can use. Mm. We had to watch people die, literally. We sometimes have to choose who, who can have um, for example, certain treatment than the other, mm. because we didn't have much stuff available. Um, so it, it, it's, it's become a very unstable that we thought there's hardly, we can't plan for future because you don't know what's gonna happen. How many wars are gonna to have to go through? We were still under sanction. There might be more wars. So it wasn't, it, was a, it wasn't an easy decision, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult because a lot of Iraqis, a lot of people were thinking the same thing, mm. that mm. we can't take this anymore. We want to go and search for a better life. So it must have been a really hard decision because you know, who wants to leave their familiarity? Who wants to leave their, you know this place, this is where you grew up, you know, your house, your, your church, your school, your butcher. Th- these things make, you know, so you must have had to make a huge sacrifice to come all the way. What's it like to have that sacrifice? Because you must have felt it when you moved to New Zealand. Because moving to New Zealand is exciting. Everything is new. But then now you are, you know, probably a year in and you're thinking, gosh, I really miss my family. Like, did you have those like homesickness days where you really missed and you really wanted to go back home? Plenty. I still have homesickness. Mm-hmm. I've been here since 1994. Yeah. I've never been to Iraq since then. Look, the the issue is the difference between us leaving and coming to live in New Zealand is different from people, who, for example, the New Zealanders who go and do an OE experience. Because when you leave Iraq, you don't know you can actually come back or not. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. The other thing is you don't actually know mm-hmm. if you can, if something happens, you can't even go back to see your family or to see your parents because when you leave, that's it. The situation is not getting better at the time, if you if you go back to Iraq before the Americans invaded, you may not be able to leave again. And after the Americans invaded Iraq, they destroyed it completely. So the whole structure of Iraq is destroyed and it's become a so unsafe place that you can't come back. So 
you have to realize that if you're going to leave Iraq, you may not be able to see what you've seen again. It's a very difficult decision. When I left, I left my mother, I left my father, I left my sister, cousins, uncles, same as my husband. We did have family outside in the UK, yes, but mm. it was like we were divided if we, when I, I remember very well my father's face when I, the last look at him and his face when I left is I, I, he didn't know if he was going to see me and he didn't see me again. My father passed away while I was in Yemen. So I didn't see him. And that was the end of it. And that eats on you. It's not easy. Mm. But it's it's like any life decision, big life decision. You've taken it. You acted on it. Um, the thing that connects to the story is, yes, we wanted to come to New Zealand and work until we get our passports, then go to the UK. But once we lived here, we loved it. It was great. And after three years, once we got our citizenship and got our New Zealand passport, we actually went to, to visit the UK. Mm. But after two weeks in the UK, I looked at my husband and said, well, we're in the UK. Do you think you want to live here? And he went, no, mm. we're, we're, we, New Zealand is where we're gonna stay. Why is that? Oh, it's, it's just a country that you fall in love with. It's beautiful, it's quiet, it's lovely. And the people are just absolutely lovely. Mm. Um, Yes, they didn't know much about Iraq. I don't think <laughs> most of them, most of them. Yeah, still, still unknown. <laughs> uh, still an unknown thing till this very day. But people are getting to know. Getting to know. Um, yeah. And but they they were very welcoming. Mm. They were really nice. They were very helpful. Mm. And also, the quality of life is much much better than living in in, in the UK. So, How would you describe the quality of life? What is quality of life well, for you? We, we, when you live in New Zealand and work in New Zealand, like I, we worked, one of the cities, for example, we started working in is in New Plymouth. We, were, we lived in a nice, lovely cottage that you open the curtains, boom, Mount Taranaki is in your face, and it's got a view of $1 million, especially when there, as it got, it's got you know, snow on it. And then yet we were 10 minutes away from the hospital. The other window on the other side of the lounge, you open it and this huge big green field with a couple of cows, you know, eating grass, they look gorgeous. You can't, you, you know, you, you do not find, you do not have that in many countries in the world. And Iraqi is immediately giddy shishi. No, it's, it's really, seriously. It's really the hard, beautiful. And yeah, and we were 10 minutes away from a beach, you wow. know? So you can ski, you can swim, you can tramp, you know, do, do walking, you can do tramping, you can, um, you know, I don't know. Is it, how many countries in the world you can do this? Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe if you live in Switzerland, I I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. But but it's <laughs> that's it. The other thing is also work. Like once you start working mm -hmm. and you start to love what you're doing, mm -hmm. you don't want to change that. Mm -hmm. And you know, we started. We just started finding our niche to start finding loving the work, yeah. deciding what we're going to do, uh, putting a plans for, and. Uh, you just love New Zealand. It's just beautiful. Uh, it's just a lovely country. Set up your roots in New Zealand. So you didn't actually come to Auckland straight away. Um, you had to go to a little city, a little town, to be able to work and get get a job. A no, we job. we came to Auckland first, uh -huh. but um, and we had to settle here because most of our friends settled here, and we came to the North Shore because that's where our friends lived. So. Mm -hmm suddenly it started to become like this little niche where all the Iraqis come. So people who know us also came, who came after us, who knew us, came here. <laughs> so you have this little community in, in the North Shore. Mm. We stayed in Auckland until we finished um, uh, getting our um, qualification recognized. We had to sit through exams. Mm. And, and I worked, and Eddie worked. We both, we didn't work in medicine because we were not allowed to. Mm. I worked as a teacher aide in a primary school. I loved it. Um, it's fantastic and it was lovely. And um, Eddie worked in a supermarket. And the work was really good because A, it gave us opportunity to get out of the house, not just sit down and study, study, study. Yeah. Also, um, to be mixing up with people, to get the um, feel of um, people. We spoke English, but here they speak New Zealand, Kiwi English, Kiwi English. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, and also it gives you um, that chance to to mix with with the with the no you know with, with the Kiwis with the locals yeah. and it's 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 fantastic. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So, but once we finish our 
um, qualifications, um, re, you know, sort of recognized, being recognized yeah, by medical council and you yeah. start work. We, we, we found a job in, in your, New Plymouth area, Hospital. Yeah. In your area of expertise. Yeah. I suppose you have already sort of talked about like how you adjusted to life in New Zealand. Was it easy to adjust? Um, it's not, it wasn't that difficult because we, when we came in, we already came from a very westernized way of life. Okay, mm-hmm. when I came mm-hmm. from Iraq, I always, 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 you know, I had my own car, I could drive by myself. Um, I used to go into hospital and come back. I used to go to social clubs, um, you know, um, swimming pools and things like that. So the way of life I lived was a little bit westernized. So when I came to New Zealand, it wasn't a huge difference. The only adaptation I had to do is to try to understand the habits mm. of people around like you know um certain times of breakfast lunch and dinner which we didn't have in iraq Did if you know with the six o'clock everything shuts down and nothing oh that was uh, that's horrible <laughs> <laughs> I, it, baghdad was a night city you know when we used to go out we we went out at nine o'clock that's yeah. when our evening started yeah <laughs> um also as I said, it was a quiet. It was, you know, I'm used to bustling shopping streets and mm. you know areas. Yeah, night yeah, not shopping in areas and areas mm. and so yeah, in, in a way, yeah. The other thing which was very interesting, yeah. I didn't want, I don't want it. It's 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 not meant to be a criticism at all. Mm. Uh, but people from the Middle East like to dress up always, so you don't go out not adre- not dressed properly. That's something you grow up on. Yeah. So, to, choir, like, so, to, to the earrings. Right? So we were very, very overdressed for New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, yeah. it's a funny thing actually. So and it, we've never people. The only people who walk barefooted in Iraq are the deprived. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> people who have nothing to buy shoes or slippers with. Oh my gosh. But people here love it and do it for. For the, for the for the for the feeling, you know. Yeah. So it was a huge shock because when we first saw people walking barefoot on the street, I went, "Oh my God! Don't they have money to buy it there?" You know, <laughs> and it was like, oh my God. seriously. But then, and then, it's more than one person, and it could be someone who's driving the latest car or something like. And I thought, I don't think it's a matter of money. I think they just like they to just work. Like it, don't like it. <laughs> so, so it was it was quite. A, yeah, that's one of the things that acquired. It took us a while to sort of tame down our over, you know, like to, to try not to be overdressed and yeah, over, yeah, yeah. you know, looking 200% yeah, right yeah, for, yeah. for any outing. Mm. Mm. Do you do that? To, like, have you adjusted till now? Um, or I suppose that you, do you feel like you're a Kiwi? Like, do you feel like you're a... A Kiwi Iraqi, or are you still Iraqi? I think I'm a Kiwi Iraqi, but as far as dressing, I'm a I'm a shopaholic. <laughs> I like to buy stuff. No, uh, uh, I think it changed a lot. Um, it's changed especially after COVID because we became more practical. That's all. But I don't know. I'm a woman and I like shopping, so I, I always I always dress. I try to dress up mm. at work when I don't have to be on call or we wearing my scrubs so if i'm sitting in my office or doing teaching or um yeah i, I do work that does not involve mm. spoiling my clothes i like to dress up yes makes me feel good oh that's it's very important to feel good right i mean if we're not feeling good then what's the point life is too short so you you moved to new zealand and you were thinking okay so i'm starting life i'm adjusting trying to get as much as i can um of learning the system and everything and, and I have a job now I want to start a family mm. how did that go for you it wasn't easy because in medicine your life is never stable even when we started working here we didn't always end up being in the same city my husband and I so we started working in New Plymouth then I decided I wanted to specialized in obstetric and gynecology and I got into the training scheme for that Mm -hmm. he wanted to specialize in surgery and he ended up in Wellington oh wow so for for a period of time we were sort of living in different cities um to to try and 
you chase the, the our dream. Yeah. <laughs> um, I w- was more lucky than him that I had my training years. When I got into the program, I had my training years set for me. Like I knew exactly where I was going. He, at the time, he was looking to become a surgeon, so he had to spend a couple of years in certain hospital. But he, he, he wasn't on the on the training scheme. But then, after spending two years, he decided this is not what he wants to do. Mm. He changed into doing. He decided he's going to do emergency medicine instead. Mm. So for a period of time, I was in New Plymouth. He was in Wellington. Then I ended up in Hamilton, and he ended up in New Plymouth. Then I came back to New Plymouth for six months, and he was there. And that was like in in the middle of my training, six months together. Then I ended up going to Middlemore in Auckland, and he stayed stayed in Wellington. (laughs) You were so anyway, so I was one right. and finally, yeah. finally, we got together in my last year of training yeah. um, in, in Auckland. Mm. Both found he, I, I was in my last year of training, yeah. sitting my final exams. Yeah. He, he, I found a, a nice position and a job, and um, pursuing his 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 long term issues, you know, sort of training with emergency. So it's by that time we're together, okay, but we. Also, do you start a family now or do you finish your exams? Okay. okay. To do, there's a lot, anyone who does medicine, there's lots of exams. There's exams all the time, you know, small exams, big exams, written exams, oral exams, <laughs> every month exam. <laughs> this was a, like a major exam. It was like your specialization, your final degree. It requires a lot of preparation. So you have to stand and say, okay, do I want to start a family now? Or do I? And the juggling between if you want to start a family, you want to give it everything. You know, you don't want to have two minds. It's not easy to study when you have children because mm-hmm. your attention will not neither be on the children nor on the study. Mm-hmm. So finally, um, I decided, okay, we'll start a family once I get my degree. And that's what happened. I got my degree. And then um, I started working in my speciality um, as a specialist. Specialist, yeah. Um, and How then, long did it take you to become a specialist? Well, um, seven years. Wow. And um, and then wow. I started my family, but then I thought I actually want another great degree. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I had a passion in ultrasound, and I liked it. And that's another degree on top of your degree. So that's another three years. Mm-hmm. But I did the, the ultrasound degree while I was while I had two little children. It wasn't easy, but I had a lot of support. I want to know how like was it easy to actually have children in your in your because you know this is something that a lot of you know couples you know go through and you know I wonder if you'd like to talk about this subject or not I'm not too sure but um, it, you know trying to have a family these days a lot of people go through that and it's a challenge was it a challenge for you? Um, uh, when we started we wanted to have children we didn't have I mean we, luckily we didn't have any issues like mm-hmm. I got you know, we, we could, I got pregnant. Mm. The issue is mostly who's going to support you. If you have the style of life we have, which is the work we do, mm. it's 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 not certain hours. Um, sometimes you may not be coming home. Sometimes you have to leave, ha- the ho- you know, leave the house at three o'clock in the morning and come back at five or come back at eight. Um, I was lucky that my mother and father-in-law were living with us mm-hmm. and they, they were fantastic, wonderful grandparents and they loved and adored my children. And I knew very well that they would be in better care than even better than me mm-hmm. if I had to leave. So they supported me a lot. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how we were able to have a family, but at the same time, continue to do what we do. That's great. I mean, you know, I, I suppose it's good to have family like, you know, your in-laws, your um, your your mother. I mean, is it do you get along with your mother? I've lived with her for many years. She's lovely. <laughs> uh, she's lovely. She's lovely. Okay. She's wonderful. Um, I want to now jump on to a question around where do you find yourself um how many years 28 years of being in New Zealand do you think you'll ever leave and go work somewhere else or live somewhere else no very easy no (laughs) why not um 
I mean, the only thing I miss is, I can't, I mean, I say for myself, no, mm. but let's say 10, 15 years from now, my, my children, I like to live with my children. I like to live with, I'd like to have my family around me. Mm. Let's say my children decided they want to go and live somewhere else. I would want to be somewhere close to them. I'd love, I would, I pray that they don't have to go and live in another country mm. because that means I, lo- I may have to go and relocate, but for myself, I don't want to live anywhere else. I New Zealand is home now. That's it. Mm. Uh, if I ever want to live somewhere else, it's it's going to be not something that I would be wishing to do. It probably will be the circumstances that force me to do that. Mm. Uh, and it's it's because I'm I found my how do you put it i've found my life now i've mm-hmm. got my home i've got my uh, area i've got my friends i've got my um you know community. Uh, community um i do what i do so yeah mm-hmm. it's 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 now life is it's pretty much um what i wanted to carry on um yes i do have still have dreams and hopes and plans and uh, you know things i want to do but w- at the moment i'm i'm happy with what i have so no more uk dream no 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 um i miss my family and i miss them really really badly but no um can't they, see myself living in the uk are they in the uk yes mm. Mm. Uh, you know fast forward now 28 years um you've lived so you know such a full life here in New Zealand I'm, I'm sure you've traveled around the country uh, but um, 28 years living in a Western country do you find that you have to make an extra effort to keep your language and culture alive for me it's not that hard because you do understand very well coming from I mean we still have most of our friends speak we Mm. still speak the language we had to get rid of some of the traditions you know what did you get rid of well you know the formalities really i mean there's so much formalities in the middle east you know Uh, if you go and visit someone if they visit them then you have to visit you or if you invite them they have to invite you and all sorts of things (laughs) you know when it's a feast or you know all sorts of not not I suppose put it this way, mostly going to be like uh, social traditions rather than like, you know, proper, um, mm. you know, um, traditions. We still speak the language and this day technology, you know, you, you can you can have um, Arabic speaking channels, you can watch movies in Arabic, you know, you've got the YouTube, you've got the iPad, the Internet, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. So you actually you can live in New Zealand without having to speak English. Now, there are a lot of Middle Eastern shops. You can even go and buy your stuff there and speak. You don't have to speak English because the guy who sells you the stuff speaks your language. (laughs) (laughs) So you can live in New Zealand without having to speak English. And I'm sure this is the same, not just with the Iraqi culture, it's with everywhere, you know, Chinese, Korean. um, There's a lot of people around. So there's, you know, and I see that in my patients all the time. I see some, like, I meet some people from different cultures and they've been living here for 10, 15 years, but they still don't speak English. <laughs> how do you find, like, the young ones now, um, the new generation, how do you see, do you have hope that they're going to keep this culture, keep this language alive? They, they have more difficult job because they have one foot with the Iraqi culture and one foot with the Kiwi culture. Mm-hmm. They are used to listening to Arabic and they understand most of it, but they can't speak it fluently. Um, they may want to learn when they grow up because they find it fascinating. Mm. But they, I think they're, they're the ones who have got that connection. It's like that ring that connects the, ki- the, the, the Western Kiwi culture with the Iraqi culture. But, I mean, I can't see their children going to have a lot of Iraqi tradition they may i mean my grandchildren if they were going to be in the future they may say oh my man nana came from iraq mm-hmm. it's like when i'm seeing someone who yeah. comes and speaks to me you know he looks very you know, kiwi and then she says oh yeah but my grandma came from lebanon you know mm-hmm. so many years ago but that's all what she remembers is you know her grandma's from there and this happens all the time yeah the there will still always be that 
the identity of every culture is if you keep the tradition going within that culture. So our children will always keep that tradition for our culture if we mm -hmm. keep them in that community. Once they go out and disperse, get out of that community, then they don't have that continuity. But if they stay within that community, they will keep some of that. And for example, they will get used to the language and keep it um, the, if they still have friends who belong to the same community. Um, we are Christians and we do hold our faith as being very important and integral part of our life. And as long as we stay in that church community as well, we can keep, keep, that, um, keep them in the loop as well. Um, language is a bit harder because Arabic is a very difficult language to speak yeah. and to learn. Yeah. So for them, it's easier to speak in, in English because they spend most of their life in school and everywhere else speaking the languages. Then so when they come home, they have to listen to us. Do you think the Arabic church will survive in 10 years? It's very hard. Maybe yes, maybe no. I'll give you an example. When we went to the States in America, um, Iraqis have immigrated to the United States many, many, many years ago, uh, way, maybe in the 50s even. Mm -hmm. There is fourth generation Iraqis now in, in America. Um, but the way they stayed is, is the church has adapted. So like, you know, doing a lot of stuff um, in in English, but what kept the culture going is they kept the language. So the moment you lose the language, you lose a lot of that culture. Finish. So if our church keeps that language going, mm -hmm. then you, you, you could still be there. But how is the church gonna look in 10 years time? It's very hard for me to know. To know. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's very enough difficult. is being done to keep the language alive in New Zealand? It's, mo it's different here because our numbers are not great, mm -hmm. you know, and people who um, live here are, are, are less willing to stick to that culture, to stick, to mm -hmm. give it mm -hmm. um, in importance. Uh, a lot of them prefer just to mingle and mix with the, with the other, mm -hmm. you know, with the the, with the other communities yeah mm. um it's uh, okay so we're hopeful that the culture and the language of the of the arabic community will remain um but if it doesn't remain it will be quite sad to lose it um having seen the the new generation coming through um and you can only you know you can only do so much but then if people don't really want to then that's their that's their decision, really, to keep it or not. Um, I'm going to change um, gear now and go into a different genre, and that's the health system. Because you're a doctor, you've you know worked here for a really long time, so you've seen how the health system have evolved and developed. Do you think the health system is struggling right now? Yes, it's struggling big time. Um... The health system in New Zealand was an excellent health system. It still is. Uh, I think if I compare it with the NHS in the UK or um, the American health system, the, these are the countries that I visited and I know friends that live there or, you know, we've got friends who live in Germany and work there, we always, you know, talk to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it is much better. However, I think um, that the... the Unfortunately, it was underinvested in it. There's an, uh, there's, sorry, not under, it's, it's not invested enough, mm. that the government is not invested enough in it. And if you go to any hospital in New Zealand now, if it wasn't for the immigrants, you would not even have enough doctors, nurses, or anyone. Like even as I'm talking about the level of, like if, if, I, if I take just a portion, like, Imagine I'm operating in an operating theater. There'll be me, there'll be my registrar, there'll be an anesthetist and the a technician, there'll be four or five nurses. Only probably be one or two of these people who are actually New Zealanders originally 
the rest are all immigrants. Mm. Um, imagine if we did not come here or we didn't do that. So when we came in in 1994, New Zealand give, gave maximum point if you had certain qualification because that's what New Zealand needed. Mm. The pro other problem is is they, there's not been an investment in education, for example. Okay, we need more doctors. Why don't we have more people in the medical school? The willingness is there. A lot of our, our a lot of people want to get into medical school. Of students want to get medical school, but they made it so difficult, as a matter of fact, almost impossible to get to medical school. So what happens? They go and study overseas and they stay there. They never come back to New Zealand. That's it, you've lost them. Uh, the New Zealand qualification authority for them to recognize your overseas qualification, which is very important. I have no problems with that because you need to make sure that people who come to work here are well. Mm -hmm. However, they made it so difficult, almost impossible to recognize. Once you get your qualification recognized, mm -hmm. you can't even, no one will give you the first job mm -hmm. because you don't have enough references because you never worked here. Now they made it so difficult, like people will just go to Australia, very easy. And so we are bleeding doctors, we are bleeding nurses, we are bleeding midwives. The pay is better, work is better, and it's not complicated. They don't have that much um, sophistication for you to get your qualifications sorted. Mm -hmm. So it is. Mm -hmm. The other thing is currently the, the, the government at the moment is not pro-immigration, so they don't make it easy for you. While in Australia, you can actually find a job much easier. Mm -hmm than you do here in New Zealand. And that's what the problem is. How is it going, like how long is it going to take in your view to make, to actually catch up with this? It's going to take years. So being a doctor, uh, a, a Christian doctor, pose few challenges for you. Obviously the topic of euthanasia and abortion, like how do you, as especially as an Iraqi woman, who's a Christian, who's a doctor in New Zealand, um, New Zealand is a more of a liberal society. How are you dealing with that? It's not easy because you have to decide from the beginning what you want to do. Uh, the The law in, in New Zealand and the Medical Council in particular is still um, allow the doctors to practice according to their conscience. So if you're not agreeing morally with a certain thing, you can say, no, I do not want to be involved in that. So being a pro-life doctor is a challenge. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, especially in the branch I'm working. I work in obstetric and gynecology, like the big deal, you know, the, the whole reproductive, reproductive system. system thing. And so, actually, in case people don't know what you do, in simple language, what is it really your role? Like, what, what do you I'm, do? I, I'm an obstetrician, so I deal with mothers who are pregnant and deliver babies. And I'm a gynecologist at the same time, so I deal with women's diseases and women's health. So I'm a surgeon I'm, I'm at the same time, so I operate. And I'm a sonologist, so I perform ultrasound scans um, on pregnant women and non-pregnant women at the same time. Side note, when I was young, I actually wanted to be like you. <laughs> I always told my mom, mom, when I grow up, I want to be able to help deliver babies and help... You lady be a midwife. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't get paid very well. <laughs> okay, we, we, thank you so much for all the midwives. They do such a great job. fantastic. Without them, we'd be lost. And I really, I really vouch for um, better pay for midwives. Yeah. Mm. So that's what you do. That's, that's what I do. Yeah. So there's a huge moral challenge, especially like um, not as much with euthanasia because we don't tend to deal with that. Uh, I think maybe other specialities have got more into it, but uh, abortion is a big thing and, and uh, it is a big challenge. But wherever you apply for work, uh, I have to make my position clear, like in my interviews, I would say, because you get asked, is there anything you want to add? And you have to say, uh, like, I do not want to be involved in anything uh, remotely related to um, abortion. Uh, that's not just me. It's, it's, there's a lot of pro-life 
um, medical professionals, not necessarily just doctors. There's nurses, there is radiographers, there is, um, you know, anesthetists. And um, they don't, they're not necessarily all are Christians. You'd be surprised that a lot of pro-life people, like some of the pro-life people may not even be Christians. Mm. And um, it's, it's not that unusual to find people who don't want to be involved in that. It's not easy. Mm. Uh, what are the challenges that you face on, on day-to-day okay. basis? I mean, challenges mostly uh, is when you do not agree with a procedure. Like someone comes in, for example, to 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 have abortion for social reasons, or they call it social termination, or whatever. You 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 have you struggle. Yeah. You really struggle because there's no life at risk here. It's like like there's no yeah. medical issue here. There are circumstances, and these circumstances. But this is just a personal opinion. Like in a country, for example, like New Zealand. There are other venues you mm-hmm. can choose. If you're growing up in societies which are very strict, very poor, very, um, you know, um, stigmatizing for women who have children without getting married, y- you can see why sometimes young women choose to go and have abortion because they don't want the scandal. They mm-hmm. don't want their family to know. They don't want the society to prosecute them or target them, or they don't have the financial support. Well, in New Zealand, in a, in a society like this, you actually have all that. You do not have to sacrifice your child because you can, you can, um, you can get support. It's a complex issue, I know, and I don't want to topic specifically talk about abortion, but what I'm trying to say is what we do, I do struggle. I, I, I deliver babies and I've delivered thousands of babies mm-hmm. and I, every baby I deliver, I still see it as a miracle. Mm-hmm. And every time I hear about a termination, I hear we have, this is a human being with a potential mm-hmm. that we actually finally just, just cut from this world. That we, we'd never know, this, is this baby gonna be a doctor? Is it gonna be a, an artist? Is it gonna be a... Um, someone who lands on the moon <laughs> is it going to be a scientist but we will never know um that that's that's one issue the other issue is the other challenge is speaking about it in a sensitive way and trying to make your position clear is always a struggle and sometimes this by itself can bring you another form a form of prosecution people may not like you to mention the world mm. pro-life, the word um, abortion, the word you don't agree with that. And it's not easy. Unfortunately, there's a lot of hostility against um, pro-life people because, yeah, yeah we, 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 people, people don't, don't agree with the how they see Mm. So, so the, the issue. Lots of challenges. Very, very much. Have you ever been denied a role due to your stance? No. No, because you cannot do that because of it. Because it's 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 legally not. You cannot deny someone a role because of them. You may deny it, and but don't state this as the reason. Yeah. But you cannot be denied a role based on that because that's that's mm. currently it's it's illegal. But as I said, um, there are a lot of people in the medical profession or in the health profession who who, who believe the same thing. What's the consensus um, amongst um, specialists your, like yourself or doctors when it comes to abortion? We are a minority. Mm. We are. The pro-life people are a minority for different reasons. Um, as I said, like, you won't be surprised to find people who are not even Christians who are pro-life, but it's most of us are come from a faith point of view. To us, to me, life starts at conception. Mm. Okay, so anything that um, affect the life from the moment of fertilization mm. 
considered as you know to me as um you know wrong morally wrong i over time i developed an interest in moral theology and i have done some courses and i've studied it and it's it's not an easy subject i am a person who i'm a doctor and i deal with a lot of a lot of moral challenges and issues with young girls with um you know issues like rape and incest and mm. um teenage pregnancy mm. um all sorts of things mm. so it, it is a very big wide mm. you know sensitive area that you have to trade in very carefully mm. you have to do your duty first which is to save the life of the patient the mother mm. But in doing this, you have to also do it without breaching the co- conscience and the, the moral conscience that you've got or the, the, the belief that you have. So when people think about, for example, what happens if the woman is dying? Well, you know, that's easy. There's no, it's not, it's not like we're not going to stand there and say, oh, yeah, yeah, she have to die. Because, no. Saving lives is different from choosing electively to end a life. That's so your me. stance is basically faith based, or is it my faith based? based? Yeah. Faith and well, faith and science. To me, they're both going the same way. Because the majority of um, doctors did not uh, support the abortion bill. There was a lot of um, um, rejection against the bill that passed in two thousand twenty. In that, March. that was a horrible bill. What happened in 2020 was a crime. What happens in 2020 was without the knowledge of everyone during lockdown, this government had passed a law that you can kill a baby any time until even until before it's born. So basically any woman, any woman in New Zealand, doesn't matter how far pregnant she is, if she wants to get rid of her baby, she can. That's the law. However, finding the person who's willing to do it is another issue. Because this government, as incompetent as it is, that passes laws to please some people, but they don't actually think about how this law is gonna be applied. Okay, you decided you're gonna give them the freedom to get rid of the baby, for example, when they are 30 weeks pregnant. Okay, who's going to do this procedure? Mm -hmm. Because at 30 weeks, if you deliver this woman, the baby will live. So technically you have to kill the baby inside the woman Mm. before the baby's delivered. Because by changing the law, before you cut the cord, her baby has no right. The moment you cut the cord, Mm. that baby is a human. So if you kill a baby before you cut the cord, that's considered as termination of pregnancy, abortion, and every woman has the right to do it. If you actually cut the cord, and the baby is now an individual human being, and you kill it, that's homicide. So the cord is the silver lining. Yeah. So before baby separated from mom has no right. Whatever the mother decides, that's it. After it's separated from the mom, it's an individual. So if you actually kill that baby, mm. that's considered homicide. The other issue is they took away the counseling. So any woman who have wants abortion now doesn't have to go through a counselor. And that's also a big mistake. Because a lot of women don't actually know much about the options. Mm. Sometimes you sit down and they think, oh, it's the end of the world. I'm pregnant. But he says, hang on a second. What's the issue? What are you worried about? Oh, I can't raise a child. Okay. Have you considered adoption? Have you considered? There are places like, for example, um, Family Life International here is an amazing um, organization that Mm. provides even houses for women who are pregnant Mm. and want don't have any place to stay in and have their babies. Um, people who are waiting, for example, for adoption have to wait for years if they even even get to get to adopt a baby because no one puts their baby for adoption. They either terminate the baby or keep the baby. So it's 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 a big. So there's no counselling now. So a lot of women, once they decided, that's it. The other thing is the counsellor also sometimes can get into this woman's like when they're they're, they're trained to to look into this woman's feeling. Mm. And you might find that the decision of abortion that she took was after, for example, um, 
a quarrel or a, 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 you know, fight with her boyfriend or with her partner and she made the decision and she wants it done. But then if she actually waits a day or two, she yeah. might change her mind. Uh, um, yeah. the, even the worst thing, uh, people might find this is, now you can do it by phone. Really? So you can just ring a phone number and say, I don't want my baby. I want an abortion. And the person on the other side of the phone will say, okay, how far are you? So you say, okay, eight weeks pregnant. Okay, give me your name, your address. And they send you the whole kit because now you can do it with tablets. And this is to, from a medical point of view, leave the pro-life issue. From a medical point of view, it's very dangerous because A, I could be lying. I might be 24 weeks pregnant, not eight weeks pregnant. And you're giving me a pill to get rid of my baby and the baby may live. <laughs> so there's no precautions no. or safety? Two, I may have an ectopic pregnancy, which is a life-threatening condition. Or three, I will swallow the pill, but then if my boyfriend three or four days later come and say, that's fine, let's get together, we'll raise this baby together. I've already taken a medicine that it's going to, if, if not make me abort, it's gonna cause significant abnormalities to my baby. So it's become so liberal now that you don't have to have any reason to basically make this decision. So what would you say the, I mean, you know, the, the, the argument in parliament was an, you know, an argument for pro-choice that it's, you are, you know, at the end of the day, giving the woman a choice. You know, you are giving the woman the ultimate say into what she should do with her health. Now, you know, this is open for interpretation because there's another individual that she's holding and she's giving birth to, but what is your true response to, well, we need to give the woman her choice. If she wants, she can do whatever she wants to do. But it's not her body. It's the, 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 the slogan they use, my body, my choice. Yeah, that's fine. But it's not your body. If it was you doing, you know, doing something to your body, yes, it is your body, your choice. You want to have breast implants. You want to change the shape of your eyes. Mm -hmm. You want to, you know, do something to your body. That's your choice. But this is not a your body. It's another human being living inside you. We consider species of, of, for example, birds. So you consider the bird's egg. For example, if you're having a big, I have a friend who's an engineer who works in a very big engineering company. If they're having a big project and suddenly there's a bird's nest mm. where they're digging, they stop the digging. They have to bring people, specialized people who move this nest that's got eggs in it into a different area mm. so that you won't harm the the bird or the eggs so we do that for birds and eggs but we don't do it for humans okay there's an argument considering the baby is not alive as long as it's inside mom so it has no rights okay the paramecium which is a, a single cell organism is considered alive but the baby's not mm. it doesn't make sense the other thing is there are medical risks of termination, major medical risks and psychological risks. Mm. Now we're seeing women who are not having one abortion, two, three, four, five. Mm. There's risks of bleeding, there's risks of infection, there's risks of even losing your uterus, there's risks of having, um, not being able to get pregnant again. There's loss, if you got pregnant, you may lose your pregnancy because your uterus will not hold the baby. There's many risks plus mm -hmm. psychological risks. I will never, I've never ever, I've do, I'm doing obstetric and gynecology since 1994 when I started working in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I have never seen a woman regret keeping her baby, never. But I've seen so many women regretted their abortion. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. So, to me, it's a very sensitive issue. I feel very passionate about it because I am the one who sometimes who can see the baby scream for the first time. Mm. And 
change, you know, looking at this creature who's a complete wonderful human being, regardless what the baby's going to turn out to be, but this baby was living beautifully inside mommy's tummy, but 10 seconds ago, if I cut the cord, this baby had no right. Mm. The mom could do whatever she likes with it. Mm. So it's not that easy, mm. and it's an easy way out. It's an easy solution. And mm. every baby that every woman, every decision is made for an abortion, it's take a toll on a woman psychologically. And we see that. We mm. see it. I can, I can certainly feel and, you know, feel the, the weight of this issue on yourself and perhaps other doctors who, who are, you know, going through that, who can relate to your experience. It's good to talk about that because it is an important subject and uh, yes, it's, it's controversial, um, but you know, we don't shy away from chatting about these things. Um, what, what, we want to finish on a lighter note. <laughs> And um, I suppose, you know, you've lived in New Zealand for that long and you've been to many places in this beautiful country of Aotearoa. What is your top three locations to finally end our episode? Top three. Okay. I have to say um, New Plymouth. Okay. Maybe call it my first love. Oh, that's nice. (laughs) This is the first city that we worked in. Mm. A beautiful place. Absolutely wonderful especially um, the the whole um, um, towns around um, Mount Taranaki, beautiful area. Mm. Um, I also um, loved Queenstown. Mm. It's just amazing. Like it's a different, completely different world. And um, Aratown, I loved Aratown. Yeah, Yeah. I always, if I was not a specialist or doctor, I would, if if I was a writer who write novels and very famous, I would buy a lovely house in Arrowtown, <laughs> sit there and write my novels. It is just beautiful. There's so many places. It's just lovely. But these are the three that I really um, can see myself every now and then having a, a, a time of relaxing in a New Zealand. So Plymouth, Queenstown and Arrowtown. Yes. And if you weren't a doctor, you would be... No, no, that just that was how how I live there. I know. I know. <laughs> if you weren't a doctor, what would you? What would? What else would you be? Oof, it's very hard because I wanted to be a doctor when I was six. Wow. Okay. For a period of time in my teenage years, I wanted to be a nuclear physicist, but then that did not. <laughs> that phase did not stay very long. That's huge. I enjoyed. Um, yeah, I enjoyed. I enjoy operating i enjoy medicine uh, if i wasn't a doctor what would i be i would have probably been a scientist of some sort i love science science is my passion um if i if i didn't want to be anything to do with science i would have loved to be a singer oh that's but you sing already <laughs> yeah, but i would have professional, professional. singer professional <laughs> singer yeah i would have loved to be a singer it's yes. it's it's i think it's it's lovely and i think um especially if you can sing and if you've got a you know nice voice or yes. you've got nice songs and it's never too late my uh, performing is lovely but <laughs> do you sing to your patients as they get the i i i'm actually very very famous <laughs> in the hospital that i i always have music when i'm operating oh, yeah. i always sing what do with you put my, on? anything i tell them i ask them what you like to listen today so every time uh, and I listen to Arabic, uh, pop, they enjoy it a lot. Wow. Uh, sometimes I say, okay, do you want to see internet? We decide to have a Greek day, so we listen to God bless Spotify, it oh. saved our lives. But it's it actually, the patients enjoy it very much, especially when they come to theater and they're very mm. stressed and are trying to make it lighter so that they can, you know, release yeah. that some of that stress away and a lot of people actually the, their patients enjoy having music in theater i didn't know that i didn't know that it's i good. always operate with music have you ever operated on rock music rock hard rock <laughs> soft rock metal. classical <laughs> metal you name it really? i've heard it rap oh, anything really? sometimes i give the choice to the staff like today is the anesthetic anesthetist's choice he can choose what they want or the nurse's oh. choice um music from the 50s from the 80s do you want jazz today 
Um, if Did you just put it on your phone and you just... I just, just um, yeah, yeah like Bluetooth. Speakers? No, it's Bluetooth speakers. <laughs> but it's very embarrassing because you may have a call in the middle of it. <laughs> oh, everyone can hear it. <laughs> and everyone can hear what you said. But it's, it's um, yeah, I, I think, I think music, music, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a God's gift. <laughs> so if you, if you retire, would you pursue music full time? I have a 101 bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> What's your top three? <laughs> oh my God, so many things. You wouldn't believe it. Um, um, music is one of them. Um, learning a new language mm. is one of them. Um, learning ballroom dancing, especially salsa. Uh, what else I want to do? You're I want to. Still in my bucket list. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to travel. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I want. I I have a passion working with. Um, I love to to be able to work, not necessarily in medicine, but to work with children with special need. I like it. It's it's an area that is very challenging, but it's very very rewarding. Yeah, why is that? Uh, it just shows you how vulnerable we are, mm. and also it's part of what these children change you and make you a better person and it's not them who are benefiting from you looking after them it's actually you mm. who benefit from looking after them and eventually you find you'll actually develop so much better qualities mm. and you become a better person mm. because they teach you so much mm. and i think It's they're their gift to to whoever. It's mm. it's a challenging gift, mm. but I always look at it as they're actually. I, I feel they purify me in a way. Mm. They make me get rid of all the negative stuff that I have in myself, because to look after someone like that, you have to sacrifice or you have to get to the basics. Get to basics. You have to change. You have to make life easier. And also, they they're beautiful. They they have beautiful souls. That's a lot on your list. Hmm. Um, what would you say, finally, what would you say to your younger 16-year-old self? I need to be more patient. I don't, I don't have patience. One thing. The other thing is I need to believe that I can do things, but sometimes it's not the way I, the way I want to do them may not be the right way. Uh, and the third thing I would say, always trust in God. He works in mysterious ways. I do not believe my coming here to New Zealand was a chance. I just believe he planned it all. Yeah. <laughs> and in one way or another, yeah. that plan worked. Maha, thank you so much for coming into the show. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope, um, yeah, I wish you all the best. I wish that this channel of yours becomes one of the people's favorite channels and your viewers will increase thank you. Exp you know exponentially as time go by thank you shukran jazilan thank you so You're much in Arabic. Welcome. and god bless you bless you too and this is our episode i i was so engrossed in having this conversation that i forgot to tell you to subscribe if you've enjoyed this episode if you have found value hit the subscribe button on on youtube um if you're listening on spotify thank you um uh, please leave us a review Um, because that helps us a lot. Um, if you leave a review or if you subscribe, the system will, the algorithm will share our videos quite a lot to, for more people to reach our content. And I would love for more people to reach our content. I'm trying to get to 1,000 subscribers and I believe in you to help me get there. So thank you so much. Until next time, see ya.